From the city of Beaky Blinders, Birmingham, England, I would like to introduce you to Paddy Dandar. As the world becomes more automated and the robots take over, it's imperative that we build the right human skills for the future. So pull up a chair, grab a smoser or two, and make yourself very uncomfortable. So EA, what I'd love for you to do is share some more of your superpowers on this particular episode. So you talked to me before about givers and takers. What are the elements of this concept of givers and takers would you like to share with us? I'd love to. And part of that has to do with this word that's out there today. And the word has changed meanings. And I can use how that can happen by virtue of another word. Years ago, there was a word spelled D-I-E-T. The word's diet. Many years ago, if I went to a meeting of two or three people, I actually went to a diet. The meeting was called a diet, right? And then years later, spelled the same way, if I received a stipend or I received an, a regular allowance, that was called diet. My allowance or my stipend was called a diet. Then years later, years I was growing up, the word diet meant the way I ate. It was my regular eating habits. It was my daily diet, the way I ate. Now, if you say the word diet, it means weight loss, right? All those times, the word has been spelled the same way. Totally different meanings each time, right? And I see, I sense, Patty, that we're seeing the same thing with this word called community and communities, all right? And I ask your listeners this question. See, have you ever had this happen? You get invited to join a community. You get conjoled. Come in. We're all the like mine. And then two or three la- two or three hours later, they're trying to sell you everything under the sun, right? First of all, that's not a community. That's what I call a taker community. Also, I call that, it's not a community. It's a customer prospect list. Call it what it is. Why are you baiting and switching me, right? It, it, call it what it is. And then I'll decide, do I want to be on your customer list? I may be interested in your products. Maybe not, but at least be straight with me and say, it's our customer list. And we send out information on our products, right? But don't bait and switch me and say, this is a great community. And all of a sudden come in and now all of a sudden you're hitting me to buy everything, right? So there's a, and I've seen this difference now with this more evolution of more and more communities doing that with the primary intention of taking something from you or making money off from you, which I submit to you is not a puritanical community. There are many communities that are great, that there's communities that help dogs. There's communities that help children. There's many great communities, right? But these are not designed to make money off from you or to take something from you. They're doing a genuine good work. And so we're through this course and the start of second round of interviews I'm doing, I'm helping people and sharing with them the distinction between a giver community and a taker community. And again, I wasn't taught this stuff. I was taught it by my, I, I, w- I didn't make up this stuff. I was taught it by my mentor. Two important things that are important components of a real puritanical giver community, if I can share them with you. The first one my mentor said, and I was a teenager at this point, late teens. And he said, let me teach you about this thing called life. I said, okay, I definitely want to hear about this, right? He said, picture in your mind this scale and the scale has on the right side of it all the things you're going to receive in your life, all the benefits, all the rewards, all the income, all the things you're going to receive in your life all come from that right side of the scale. He said, the left side of the scale is all the things you're going to give, contribute, invest, help others. All that is on the left side of the scale. Interesting thing about the scale. It's never out of balance. It strives for balance. So even at a moment in time, when it statically looks like it's out of balance, it will right itself and does very quickly. So it strives for balance is always in balance. He said, the next thing I'm going to share with you is a little bit challenging. He said, but you can get your head around it. And when you do, you're going to get very powerful. He said, here's what you do. Forget about the right side. He said, but that's hard to do because everyone wants to, how do you forget about what you're going to get out of it, right? What you're going to do. He said, I'm telling you, it works this way. If you forget about the right side and you make it your daily goal to heave so much on the left side of that scale, your goal each day is to get that scale out of balance. 
because you put so much on that left side. And he said, when you do that, you'll never have to worry about your money that you make and your income and all the things you're going to get from that right side of the scale. And he dubbed that the giver's scale of life. And that's a critical part. And it's not only, it's a relationship aspect, but once we are able to discern the people through their deeds that we should have closer or respectfully distance, that opens the door for us to let that scale of life really work, right? The second thing is, this is a, even today, Patty, this blows my mind that my mentor came up with this. You know, I told you about, you know, him growing up in the depression and, you know, literally for meals, ate cardboard. Well, because of his lack of good nutrition, he became had an extreme case of diabetes and it took his life early, unfortunately, decades early. But as we were together for in many businesses and over years, one day he came to me and he said, I said, EA, yeah, I'd, I'd like to have us compete. I said, okay. And at this point, by the way, we were splitting everything 50, 50, right? I'd worked my way up into the companies and, you know, through my performance and deeds, et cetera, we pretty much were equal partners on everything across the board. And he said, I'd like to have us compete. And I looked up at him because I was working on my desk and I could see that glimmer in his eye. And I said, oh boy, I know that look. This is going to be really interesting. <laughs> he knew that look when he had that sparkle, right? And he said, and I said, okay, what do you mean by compete? He says, well, this is what I propose. We have a contest every year by year. And he said, and here's what we're going to do. We're going to compete to see who can make the other one more money. And he said, the one that loses has to buy the winner anything they want. I said, what? I said, okay, wait, let me think about this. And I want to re-say it to make sure I understand what we're talking about. Here. All right. What you're saying is we're going to compete every week or every year. We have a contest. And the contest is that if you make me more money than I made you, I lost and you won because you made me more money. Then you get to ask me for anything you want. And I, as the loser, have to buy it. He said, yeah, that's right. And I said, okay, but the other side of the coin's right too. Also that if I make you more money than you made me, you're the loser, I'm the winner, and I get to ask for anything I want and you have to buy it for me. He said, that's absolutely right. Patty, I'll never forget the breath I took as I sighed and said, okay. I went, okay, <laughs> this is going to be really interesting. The first year, he beat me so bad, it wasn't even funny. And I, as a result, paid cash for him for an entire home in Florida. Now, I couldn't be mad. He made me more money than I made him. I had the money. It wasn't I didn't have the money. And then I thought, man, I better get smart quick. This is going to be brutal <laughs> if I don't get this figured out really fast, right? And then the next year I won and he bought me my first plane. And then that's when I became a commercial pilot. The next year he bought me a limousine. The next year he bought me a second plane. And then, so, and then we just started carrying it forward. And Patty, then it dawned on me. With that perfect 2020 hindsight vision, it hit me what he had really done. He knew, here I am in my 30s, that he wasn't going to be able to keep up with me. He knew his health was deteriorating rapidly. We both knew it. He wasn't going to be able to keep up with me just out of sheer schedule and time and effort. His energy level was plummeting and, you know, his deter the, the diabetes was taking a definite toll. And, you know, and he knew. So because of that, he wanted me to listen. He wanted to come up with a way because we were splitting everything 50, 50. He knew I'd be putting in more effort than he would. And he didn't want my mind to get goofed up. So he crafted, and I thought, what kind of man comes up with this? What kind of person thinks in advance? What could happen that my mind could get goofed up because we're splitting everything and I'm putting in more effort than he is because his health isn't allow him to do it. And, and to come up and craft this whole thing like that, knowing he wanted me to win from the very, what kind of person does that? And I dubbed that later on, Patty, the giver's one intention, the giver's contest intention. The giver's contest intention means we have a fiduciary relationship to give to the other person more than they give to us. In fact, we're even competing to do it. 
Now, that is something different. I'm speechless. I'm honestly speechless. <laughs> I, I was just thinking about that and I was thinking, that's such a great game. I'd love to play with a few of my friends. I, I don't think I'd win much, but <laughs> it's, uh, well, that's how you learn, right? I bought that house and I got smart fat. But, <laughs> but it had a, you know, the, the incredible part about this was that he taught me with community now. And I had one gentleman say, well, you know, that sounds pretty utopian. I said, it, it's not. I said, how can you say it's utopian when I lived it? I lived, if that's utopian, then I want to let you know that utopian exists. And I just lived it. I said, because I had a mentor who was a giver, who taught me these things, who lived by these things. That's why discernment is so important. That's why we have to discern better. You have a few people close to you that are all givers than to have a thousand people around you and 990 of them are takers. All those Facebook so friends. You'll get way, you'll get way more accomplished with those few really key people. Yeah. And uh, so he taught me this thing and in the interest of time, cause I, I want to be uh, respectful for everyone's time. There's actually a system we use to putting together these communities. So I'd like to hit it real quick so that your listeners could listen to this podcast multiple times and share it with others as well. And it, it's actually a methodology to form a community. There is a book out that's an excellent read. It's called Think and Grow Rich by Napoleon Hill. And, and Napoleon does an excellent job of explaining something called the mastermind. Now, when he wrote that book and explained it, it was very novel. It was certainly new to many people. So he, at that point, he was just explaining it, right? This is what it is. He never really explains how to do it. So we have taken, we have gone that next step at a very granular approach and said, okay, this is a spectacular thing. We know works. We know. Whenever two minds form together in a spirit of harmony, a third mind is formed and great ideas come from that. And the power does too. We know that. We know it to be true. So through that, here's how you do it. First of all, we call them in Givers University, we call them Juntos, J-U-N-T-O. And, and basically a Junto is a word from the 1600s, a Spanish word. It wasn't used much in the 1700s. It was picked up by a gentleman by the name of Benjamin Franklin. And, and he made the term much more well-known. In 1727, Benjamin Franklin put together a group of himself and 12 friends. There's 12 friends totally together. And he named this group the Mutual Improvement Club. Later on, he called it the Junto. Later on, he called it the Leather Apron Club. Basically, and, and they met each week. They met every Friday. They met for a couple of hours and they talked about everything. Business, politics, ethics, morals, helping each other. You know, I mean, they just, I mean, they covered the whole broad swath. And what's interesting is that our, in the United States, our very declaration of independence could arguably be traced back to the conversations Ben Franklin had at his Junto. So no one can tell me Juntos aren't powerful and they can be powerful. So, and, and we teach actually three different kinds. A Junto by nature is a group of people getting together for a common interest or purpose. That's a Junto, right? So. We teach three different kinds of Juntos. Now there's many different kinds. You can, there's all different kinds, but we help people build their own. We help them at no cost, build their own Juntos, right? And it could, because we know as givers community, our job is to get that scale out of balance, to put as much on that left side of that scale as we can. So the first kind is called a greater Junto. The greater Junto could be any size and any number. You know, could have chapters around the world. A good example might be Salvation Army, VFW, Lions Club. Those might be good examples of, you know, a, a greater Junto, a giver's greater Junto worldwide, right? Then there's a giver's insider Junto. This is more two to 12 members, more close-knit, intimate group. Closer example would be uh, Ben Franklin's Leather Apron Club. You know, that would be a good example of an insider Junto. Two to 12 members, close-knit more intimate relationships, helping each other on a more intimate level in all parts of their life. And the third is what we call the giver's millionaire Junto. Now this is two to 12 vetted millionaires. So we have to do the vetting before we can even connect them to a Junto if they want to start one. But these are a group of millionaires that get together for a common purpose or interest to accomplish that. First of all, a good example of that was my business mentor and myself. That's the giver's millionaire Junto, right? Another good example was, uh, there was a gentleman by the name of Henry Ford in 1915. He formed a millionaire Junto with himself, Thomas Edison, 
Harvey Firestone from Firestone Tires and John Burroughs. And John Burroughs was a writer, a poet, also a federal bank examiner. So I guess he must've been the money guy, but anyway, there, so there was four, four in there in this millionaire's Junto and, and Henry Ford named themselves. He gave them a name, the four vagabonds. And they used to travel together and they helped each other in business. And, you know, it, it, so certainly these things are real things. And I've seen over the years, Patty, so many times where people have wanted to form a mastermind or a group together and they get together with good intention. And then within a couple of months, it just dissipates, right? It just sort of disassembles and life is busy and they're, and they're, and that made me curious. Why is it dissipating? What's so different? What's happening that there's no glue there, if you will. So we began to look for and seek those answers. And that's what I'm going to do in a little more rapid fire for your listeners. And as we close up here a little bit on an interview, and it spells the word discern, D-I-S-C-E-R-N. Interestingly enough, also what we teach. The D stands for decide. The first thing you have to do is decide who do you want to have in your Junto, right? And we actually provide free checklists that they can use, the 25 do's. Go through the checklist, put check marks on the left and the right for the givers and takers deeds. And on the bottom, you got your total. There's no decision being made. It just was made for you, right? So the D stands for decide. The I is for invite. How do you invite these two to 12 members, assuming it was an insider Junto? The S is for seed. You explain to them the purpose of the Junto, the commitments. We have what we call the three pillars of a Junto. And then also we have the one intention. The one tension is the contest intention that comes from the story I shared with you from my mentor about the contest that every member, if there's 12 members in an insider Junto, they all must agree up front expectationally that each of them will compete to give more to the other 11 than they themselves are receiving. Now, when you get that kind of agreement up front, what kind of power you think is going to come out of that? It's very powerful. So the S that is for seed, the C is for convene, convene on a regular basis, weekly, monthly, biweekly, quarterly, convene on a regular consistent basis. E establish it, give it a name, uh, like the four vagabonds with Henry Ford or the leather apron club with Ben Franklin, give it a name. That camaraderie is really important to have people to be a part of that group. R is for rotate, have a different chair, each meeting, have a different person be in charge of it. We even at givers university, if they want to help and they want to form a givers Junto, which we help them provide uh, set up, we actually give them an agenda that they can cover each week. This is what you cover this week. And you have a different chairperson every week. That's what the R is for rotate to different leaders, right? No one's greater than anyone else in the group. Everyone has one clear intention, and that is to give more to the group than they're getting back. That's what makes it work, right? And then the N is for numbers. Develop other Juntos. Be a part of a millionaire Junto and an insider Junto. Be a part of a couple insider Juntos. Develop those and seed those and, and craft them around the world. So that spells the word discern. And, that is, and we actually walk people through. They can go to our YouTube and go to the playlist, how to form your own community. And uh, there's videos on there, two minute clips, step by step, two minutes on the first step. How do you decide, how do you decide what a giver community is? Then what's the next step? What's the next step in two minute clips all the way through. And we're building those. And the one that's coming out tomorrow morning is on a uh, seed. It's for the S. So we've covered everything up to that point. We provide all this because we know, and we recognize in a time, Patty, where we need more hope than ever before. The power and strength of a group of people like-minded and like spirit getting together and helping each other with a fiduciary responsibility that they've all agreed up front and will be held accountable to giving more to the group than they get back. Now you've got real power in your life and people from different backgrounds and experiences and go through story after story of how these Juntos work. And it's important, just as important as having a mentor is having a Junto. So uh, thank you for being able to share that, uh, being able to share it with your listeners. Well, EA, again, I've sat here patiently listening because I, I wish I could almost take notes. I will be listening back to the podcast myself and actually <laughs> taking some of this down because something I'm really passionate about is 
helping build communities. And, you know, throughout your life, people say, oh, what's my purpose? What am I here for? And I've often wondered, is it the profession that I'm in? Is that the thing that I was kind of sent down for? And I always come back to, I think I'm a sort of a connector of people. And that's through various different ways, but one of them is through helping build communities. And so this is a really, it's a phenomenal topic that I'm very interested in because just as you mentioned there, I've seen the power of communities. Like my parents are originally from India and I used to go to India as a child and I used to see in these rural villages how when a community pulls together, just the support network that they create and things that I would never be able to see here in the UK. Like for years, I didn't even know who my next door neighbors were here, but there literally the whole village will know one another. And at times I used to be scared to walk from one side to the other, because I knew I'm going to have at least 10 cups of tea along the way <laughs> because people would not let you pass their house unless you came in for a drink. And yeah. it was that sort of spirit. And yeah. There, there was so much that I took away from my experiences there. But one of my big challenges is always, how do I ensure everybody contributes to the community? And just as you mentioned, within a few months, things tend to frizzle out because either someone loses interest or someone doesn't contribute enough. So I really love the idea of making that contract up front and actually we're there to serve the others and we're going to serve them more than they are going to serve us. Uh, I love that concept. That expectational agreement is so critical and that we, ho we all hold ourselves accountable to it. It's just not the new guy coming in, you know, we all hold ourselves accountable to these 25 deeds and these are things we're going to do. So for your listeners, we'd love to give you the list of the 25 deeds. It's absolutely free. They just go to our website, giversuniversity.com. It's plural, giversuniversity.com. Sign up for the newsletter. You'll get, it's absolutely free. We don't spam. You know, I hate that you sign up for something. You get six emails a day from, we do not do that. One email a week. It's on Thursday morning. It's called the giver's toolbox and the giver's toolbox. Every week we give them a new tool that they can add in their relationship toolbox. That's going to be able to help them that they can help. They can use in their business, their family or socially. But when they sign up for newsletter right away, they're going to get an email. Do you want to talk with these people? Cause we don't spam. They have to say, yes, I want to communicate with them. Then two hours later, they will get the free download automatically in their email of the 25 deeds. They should print it off, download it, print it off, put it in their pocket, begin to use it to discern in your relationships immediately. And it's also the first step to decide who do you want to have and invite into your giver's Junto. So we provide all of those tools. We provide all of those things step-by-step step, all the way through. So thank you so much, Patty. Thank you for having me on your great show. Oh, you're welcome. Honestly, it's been a pleasure. And uh, yeah, like I said, I've, I've learned a lot from this episode. So I'm, I'm sure our listeners will have too. So thank you once again. Thank you.